folks. Lots to celebrate this week. We've got a new mayor in Toronto. Stats Canada reports that we've hit a new milestone when it comes to Canada's population and some good news on the inflation front as Stats Can reports May's CPI number. Or is it all good news? Olivia Chow comes back from her hiatus uh, from politics and wins the mayorship of the city of Toronto. Out of 1.89 million eligible voters, only 38% turnout, 722,000 folks voted for one of 102 candidates. There was a long list of candidates. She edged out Anna Balau, um, 37% to 32%. So technically, she became the mayor of Toronto on just 14.1% of eligible voters in Toronto. Not the greatest turnout, and that says a lot for people who care about municipal politics. But let's get right into her platform and how it relates to real estate. The first thing on her agenda was that she wants to build 25,000 homes in the city of Toronto. The city of Toronto has tons of land and acreage that is owned by them. She wants to convert these. Now, what's interesting is she wants to do it through a Create TO fund, which means she will become a developer. And what she wants to do is she wants to create 25,000 homes of which 70% will be at market rates, rentals, 20% will be at affordable units, which means 80% of market rents, and only 10% will be geared to income units, which means they will be, uh, the rental rate will be priced at 30% of household income. So when you really drill down into this, how affordable are all these units? There's only really 10% that are geared towards um, uh, household income, where it's only gonna take 30% of that. The rest will be at market rates, and at 80% of market rates, it's still high in the city of Toronto. So what she wants to do is become a developer and landlord, and these will become profitable units. There's no question about that. And we're still looking at 60 to 70% of these being one bedroom. So not necessarily the type of real estate that is needed for home uh, for families that need affordable housing. So when you drill down into this, her plan is an eight year plan. She wants to build 25,000 homes. It's about 3,125 units per year. And only 10% of those, which is 300, just over 300 of them, will be geared towards income, right? So, uh, now, a little bit of a concern. What's interesting though, is these homes that she wants to build, she's gonna take advantage of expediting the, the permit process. She's gonna waive all development charges. She's gonna, uh, all the building permit fees will be waived. Res, uh, residential property taxes are gonna be waived. Parkland dedication fees and addition, additional municipal fees will all be waived. And these represent a big chunk of what is causing homes in Toronto not to be affordable. So it's almost funny when you think of it. She's gonna claw back all these charges that the city imposes on developers so she could build 25,000 homes at a discounted rate and still charge market rents on 70% of them. Interesting, interesting. But uh, hey, uh, it, it is what it is. She's also going to be increasing the vacant home tax which currently sits at 1%. It's been a bit of a shit show with respect to how it's been implemented. There's a lot of confusion. A lot of folks that don't speak English uh, have been having problems registering their home under this program. But she wants to increase the, the uh, vacant home tax from 1% to 3%. So not a bad plan. Um, how it's collected, how it's going to be rolled out, rolled out and enforced is gonna be really, really interesting. So I'm, I'm eager to see how that, that works out. But then she is very clear on her position. She wants to go after people buying homes over $3 million. And this is a real interesting one because she wants to increase the municipal portion of the land transfer tax. So currently uh, on properties at the 3 million level, the 
land transfer tax, the, the municipal portion of it is two and a half percent. She wants to increase it to three and a half percent, so a full point. But she also wants to scale it up every time it hits another band. So I'm going to give you an idea of what type of bands she's talking about. So anything over three million to four million, the her the, the city component of the land transfer tax is proposed to go from two and a half to three and a half. Anything over four million to five million is going from two and a half to four and a half. Anything over five million to ten million is going to go to five and a half percent. Anything over 10 million to six and a half, anything over 20 million to seven and a half percent. So if you're buying a property for five million dollars, you're looking at a city land transfer tax of five and a half percent, which is probably more than the real estate fee that the seller's paying. And this is going to be really interesting because when you add the provincial tax, you're looking at seven and a half, eight percent. That's a big chunk of money that she's trying to uh, pull out of the pockets of the rich. So interesting to see how that's all going to work out. Uh, I congratulate her on her campaign. I think she ran a positive campaign, but I still think her hands will be full with trying to get projects completed. The Eglinton LRT is still a shit show. That's been going on for over a decade. Um, safety needs to be addressed on the TTC if that's going to be a viable option moving forward. And she's going to have to make sure that um, people in the city of Toronto have an opportunity to thrive. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing what she brings to the table. She seems pretty energetic, so we'll see what happens. Second thing I want to talk about is our population growth. We hit a huge milestone just in time for the Canada Day celebrations. So on or about June 16th, StatsCan reported that the population of Canada hit 40 million people. 40 million people. And just to give people an idea of how much we've grown in the last little while, in the first quarter of 2023, we brought in 292,232 people. A growth of 0.7% in a quarter from January 1st. 98% of these folks represent permanent and temporary immigrants. 145,000 and change were immigrants, another two, uh, 155,300 were non-permanent residents, okay? So this is all in a single quarter. My question is, where the hell are they gonna live? This is unbelievable growth. And this is what's driving GDP, which is giving Tiff Macklin fits. Our Bank of Canada governor is trying to get inflation under control and we're continuously opening up our borders and bringing more and more people in, which are consuming food, consuming goods, buying groceries, putting demand on consumption. And it's artificially propping up our GDP. Among the G20 countries, we are the least productive country when it comes to productivity. And there's this false narrative that we're growing. We're growing because we're bringing immigration in. It's propping up these numbers and it's keeping uh, inflation at a level that the Bank of Canada is really struggling with. So, you know, we got this issue. Now, one of the things that I want to point out is that foreign students have hit a record number. According to the Canadian Bureau for International Education, go to their websites, big number right on the front page, 807,750 international students as of the end of 2022. Okay. That is a 31% increase from 2021 to 2022. Okay, 411,985 of them are in Ontario, 51% of that number. And they bring in a lot of consumption. Okay, It brings in close to $25 billion to the economy, if not more, between what they got to spend on housing, food, goods, transportation, whatever the case is. So this is what's fueling the uh, the economy. Everything else is kind of not doing that well. So we have to come to the understanding that if immigration stops, that's when you're going to start seeing things break to the degree they need to. But up until that point, 
it's going to be really interesting to see how the Bank of Canada navigates uh, inflation as well as this GDP number, which continues to grow. Uh, now, as far as inflation is concerned, uh, Stats Canada came out with um, the May figure. Uh, all the pundits predicted it would come in at 3.4. It actually did come in at 3.4. And uh, having drilled through the numbers, there is some concern that this could be temporary. As much as it's moving down, I think it's something to celebrate. But for the most part, there's some some concerns in there. Number one, the mortgage costs, so the borrowing costs have now crept up to 29.9%. That type, that increase is almost 30% uh, from a year ago, and it is significant. It's starting to put a damper on consumption. Household budgets are starting to scrape through all their savings, and they're starting to feel the hurt. We're seeing delinquencies uh, pop up on the credit card side, as well as the installment loan side, car loans, stuff like that. Residential real estate defaults are still relatively low, okay? Haven't seen much movement, but we're seeing forced sales, people coming to the brink and realizing that um, things are getting dire. And we do anticipate that the Bank of Canada will continue to, to rise rates and the next meeting is July 12th. I anticipate that we will see a quarter point hike and it will give um, another hit to, to consumers carrying variable floating uh, debt because it's another punch in the gut. It's gonna end up taking a bigger chunk out of their discretionary spending and people will just start spending less. Now, if we go to the used course tracker, we're seeing a jump in that. Two weeks ago, we're sitting at 1166 used Porsches for sale. And for those that are, are watching for the first time, I've been tracking this uh, data point since September of last year. And what I do is I go on Auto Trader. I look at how many used Porsches are for sale within a 100 kilometer radius of where I sit at Dufferin and uh, Orphis, just south of Yorkdale. And when we started this back in September, there was about 944 used Porsches for sale. It's now jumped up to 1194. A couple weeks ago, sitting at 1166. So that tells me people are starting to get rid of the toys. Okay, weather's better. Probably a lot more prospects out there for buyers of these uh, exotic cars. And we are seeing more and more toys up for sale. We're seeing more garage sales. We're seeing more things on Kijiji, uh, Facebook Marketplace, People are getting rid of the things they don't need. And that get, tells me that things are starting to break. But inflation continues to run rampant. Uh, the drop in inflation uh, in May had a lot to do with the gas prices. Uh, that represented a big chunk of the drop. But one thing I want to point out is in looking at the breakdown of the components, I'm starting to see that the Stats Canada is adjusting the weighting of shelter. Back in uh, May of 2022, the shelter component was almost 30%. It's now down to about 28.3% of the weighting, which tells me that they've dropped the weighting of the shelter component a little bit, not a whole lot, but the fact that they're playing with the numbers to adjust their uh, CPI index number is concerning to me because it's not the same weighting. If the borrowing cost or mortgage cost index is up 30% year over year, it should be compared against the same weighting it was last year. I'm gonna continue drilling down on these numbers and going back because I wanna see how much these weightings change. And, you know, as I've always suspected, these numbers are a little bit manipulated. So on that note, I want to wish everybody well. We'll see you next week and take care.